So grace changes everything. We've been talking about this for like the past you know, six, seven weeks. We've been talking about grace, what Jesus did for us on the cross, and how that changes literally every aspect of our life. How does grace influence who we are publicly, who we are privately, who we are corporately? That's what we've been talking about. And grace, it turns out, confronts a number of things in our culture, a number of things that exist even in our own lives that need to be confronted. They need to be addressed. This morning, what we're looking at is really no exception. This morning, we're going to look and understand how grace addresses selfishness in our culture today. Um, There is an epidemic amount of selfishness in our culture. I don't know if you know Notice this. Like selfishness is like the theme. Like that is like the theme song of America. It's all about me, right? If you go to the grocery store, uh, if, you, if you like stand in line at the grocery store, and like lately this has happened to me, I'm standing in line at the grocery store, and once I get past the tabloids, like the woman who birthed the, he- uh, the fish with three heads, that sort of thing, you know, once because those are always fun. I'm like, oh, wow, look at that. Is that true? Um, you know, <laughs> As soon as you get past that stuff, you know, you start looking at the other magazines there and you see like the little subject lines for all the things that people are writing about. And over and over again, you see that the central, central subject is me, right? It's the self. And so like I stand at the grocery store, I see that and it's crazy. Um, if you go to a bookstore, which you better hurry because they're going out of business fast. But if you go to a bookstore, they have these sections, you know, that books are divided in. And one of the largest sections in most bookstores is the self-help section. You ever notice that? This is what I've also noticed. You never go into a bookstore and see the other's help section. (laughs) Isn't that funny? Like, there's all these books on self-help, and then there's nothing on helping other people. It's like, what does that tell you about our culture? We wouldn't buy a book for a second if it was about helping other people, but we'll buy hundreds if it's about helping me, right? That's just sort of, sort of the way things go. Uh, social media, classic example, right? You go on Facebook, go on Instagram, and you will see the phenomenon called the selfie right? Like, it doesn't get any better. We have, like, a hashtag for this thing. The selfie, like, we are, it's like the selfie, this cracks me up. People post selfies, and there's some people I see, they do this all the time. It's like, all right, what are you doing? Are you just trying to, like, remind me of what you looked like because I somehow forgot what you looked like from yesterday, right? It's like, oh, I posted a picture of me. Look at me. And then, like, the next day, you're like, just in case you forgot, here's me again, you know? It's like, it's all about me, right? Here's what's crazy. Recently, there's some psychological studies that have come out, some research that's been done on the number of selfies a person posts and the relationship that it has to their tendency towards narcissism. This isn't a joke. In our culture right now, there is a correlation between the number of selfies that a person posts of themselves and their tendencies towards narcissism. And what this research has shown is that with the plasticity of our own neurology, that people are becoming increasingly narcissistic through the posting of pictures of themselves. They're changing their neurology to be more selfish by focusing on what they look like and showing everybody else those things. So this is our culture that we live in today, right? Like this is, like you go to a counselor, talk to a counselor, ask him what's at the root of the problem, no matter what the problem is. And over and over again, you'll you'll hear it's selfish. Like there's, selfishness is destroying us. We've become a me first society. And this didn't happen by accident. It's not like we suddenly landed here and we're like, how did we get here? How did we get so selfish? And in in fact, um, Philosophers and writers through the last 100 years, especially in our nation, have emphasized the need for selfishness. There's one author in particular, Anne Rand. Many of you have probably heard of Anne Rand, an author during the 60s who elevated selfishness as a virtue, literally writing a compilation of essays called The Virtue of Selfishness like made it a virtue. Her writings have been, have been lauded by people who have influenced our culture, who, is, who have arch, been architects of our society. Everyone from Ronald Reagan to Alan Greenspan have quoted and look up to Anne Rand who elevated selfishness as a virtue. Philosophers, writers have emphasized this so much that over the last 40 years, there is an entire industry that has been birthed around you becoming a better you by focusing on guess who? You, right? It's, it's, that's what it is. And even the church, I have to say this, even the church over the last 30 years has made this shift to where our participation in something like this has become less corporate and more individual. We become consumers and we participate in this out of getting something for us. So this is pervasive. We have become a society of the self. Here's what's also interesting. 
Last time I checked, it's not working, is it? Like our selfishness and all these efforts, it's not working. In fact, not only does it not work, it makes things worse. Um, Psychological research, societal research today has proven this. This is true. This isn't the Bible talking. This isn't church guy talking. These are scientists and psychologists in our culture talking. This is what they've discovered, that self-centeredness has a direct correlation to an increase in our unhappiness. Is this crazy? So we have everybody saying, get more selfish, and yet we know psychologically and scientifically that the more selfish we get, the more unhappy we become. And our our resolution to our unhappiness is what? More selfishness, right? Which explains a lot of why we're in the mess that we're in today. It explains why so many people are unhappy, so many people are desperate, so many people are reaching for things. We live in the most self-focused time in history, and with all of our self-absorption, we aren't any happier than we were before. Listen, and I was thinking about this this week. I thought, if there was anything in our life that let us down, like selfishness has let us down, like if there was a car or a house or a washer and dryer, if there were people who let us down the way that selfishness and our pursuit of self have let us down and disappointed, we would have broken up with selfishness a long time ago. Amen? Like, we would have gotten rid of selfishness. We would have fired selfishness if it was an employee of ours or a coworker of ours. Selfishness doesn't work, and yet somehow we keep living in this cycle. We keep coming back in this abusive relationship with this thing called self-centeredness, and it's doing us more harm than good. So what do we do about this? Where does this come from, and how do we address this? That's the question that we're looking at today. First, I want to tell you... Um, I want to tell you why we do this. Why are we embedded in this? The reason we keep going back is that somebody somewhere, somewhere along the line told us that this is the way things worked. And guess what? It wasn't Ayn Rand. It wasn't some writer in the 60s or some pop psychologist in the 80s. That's not where this thing began. If you page back in your Bible to the very beginning, to the very early chapters where Moses was describing how this whole journey of humanity relating to each other and relating to God began, if you open that up, you'll see that there's this conversation that takes place where a man and a woman encounter this serpent and he causes the demise, the dysfunction, the brokenness of all of humanity. And how does this this conversation begin, it begins with the serpent appealing to the selfishness of humanity. He says to Eve in the garden, don't you want, speaking of God, he says, don't you want what he has? Don't you want to see the way he sees? This is about you becoming all that you can possibly be. See, this isn't a, this isn't a new story. And and this story isn't a myth that we read about in Scripture. This is the story of the curse. This is what got us where we are in the first place. It is at the heart of humanity and has been there for so long that when we hear the voices of our culture telling us, give in to self, pursue self, do what's best for you, there's something because of our brokenness that's embedded in us that listens to those voices, that follows that path and ends in the places that it always tends to end. There's something that resonates, and it's that brokenness. So how do we change it? That's where grace comes in. Grace changes everything, including this. See, grace makes us a people for others in a world of self, and that makes an incredible difference. Um, Jesus was really clear when it comes to this, and if you look at the teachings of Jesus, you see that this topic comes up again and again, like selfishness versus self-sacrifice. This is a a fairly repeated theme in the life and ministry of Jesus. He modeled it, he taught it, and he made it possible, which is what we're going to see today. But why did he do this? Why did Jesus talk about this so much? Because he knew, Jesus knew way back a couple thousand years ago what psychologists are discovering today. That's that this pursuit of self ends in emptiness. And so Jesus is showing us the way. He shows us the truth. He shows us the life. Great example of this is Luke chapter 10. Uh, If you have a Bible, open to Luke chapter 10. There's this story that Jesus tells, and it emerges out of a debate. Um, Jesus is actually um, in an argument of sorts. He's in a debate of sorts um, with a lawyer. And I know that... It sounds like a punchline to a joke or the start of a joke. Like there's Jesus and a lawyer and they're fishing together, right? 
Um, that's kind of how a lot of things in Scripture are with Jesus. Jesus is with a lot of people you wouldn't expect sometimes. But Jesus is with a lawyer. And this particular lawyer is different than most, and I'll explain that in a second. But this lawyer stands up, and he asks Jesus a question. The question that the lawyer asks and the answer that Jesus gives is the direct question that we're asking and the answer that we need in our culture today. In the process of answering this, Jesus shows us what's beneath all of this selfishness, and he shows us how to change this. So I just want you to look with me, beginning in verse 25. It says this. It says, Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, a couple of things about this lawyer. A couple of things I want you to understand when you hear this. Um, first of all, the lawyer um, does not want to know the answer to the question that he's asking. Um, the lawyer already has an opinion. That's how lawyers work, right? Lawyers already have opinions. That's why they're lawyers. Sorry, those of you that are lawyers out here. I only offended like four people in the first service. But like lawyers have opinions. That's, what, that's why they do what they do, right? Like this lawyer in particular is a, is a scriptural expert. He's a lawyer in the law, in the Old Testament law. And he had opinions about those things that were being spoken in scriptures. In fact, not only did he have opinions, but he would spend his days debating and talking about the nuances of the law. That's what this guy did. So that's the first thing I want you to understand. He's asking the question, but that's really not what he's doing. Is he's really just presenting a case. That's what the lawyer is beginning to do. Secondly, this is the other thing you need to understand. You have to get this if you really want to understand the heart of what Jesus is talking about here. When the lawyer asks about eternal life, he is not talking about what happens after a person ceases to breathe on this planet. I know we interpret that that way. I know that we translate it that way. We hear eternal life, and what we think he's asking is, how do I know that, you know, I'm going to go to heaven when I die? That's basically the way we hear what he's saying. That is not the question that the lawyer is asking. Eternal life to a Jewish individual, eternal life in the days of Jesus was not something that referenced life after death. It was something that was referencing life before death. The Jewish consciousness was completely focused on how we live a flourishing kind of life in the present. The Jewish consciousness was about how you and I live with such connectivity to God and others that our life is full and hopeful. It's why Jesus said, I came to give them life and life to the full, because that's what people were looking for. That's the reference point for eternal life. Eternal life is a phrase that describes the quality of a person's life. How do I live a life in which I am really alive? That's the question. So when you had a chance to interact with a spiritual leader or a guru of some sort, you ask that sort of question. You say, how can I be truly alive in this life? That's the same question we're asking today, isn't it? It's why the magazines and the books and all the different stuff's being written. It's why the studies are, are conducted because we want to know how do I live a life of meaning and purpose and hopefulness? How do I live a life of joy and peace? That's the question. So, so Jesus hears the question. And then he does, he does what every good rabbi would do. He responds to him by asking this lawyer what the Torah teaches. So this is great. Verse 26, it says, Jesus said to him, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? So the lawyer says, well, tell me, how do I have this kind of life? And Jesus says, well, what's the law tell you? Puts it back on him, right? He, he does this for a very specific reason. He does this because he knows for that, for that man and for Jewish individuals, they knew, well, obedience to the law is how you're going to experience life. So he says, how do you read it? Which is his way of saying, give me a summary. As you are an expert of the law, summarize it for me. Give me the Cliff's Notes version of how a person has real meaningful life in this life. And this is what he says in verse 27. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, a lot of people look at this and they see the lawyer's answer and they're like, well, that's brilliant, 
right? Isn't that the great commandment? Like, that's great. Jesus said that. Like, this is amazing. This is so pr- profound. This is so groundbreaking and revolutionary that this guy says this sort of thing. I want to be the bearer of bad news. Um, this is the summary that Jesus expected. In fact, he's quoting Deuteronomy. So this is the summary that Jesus thought this man would say. He thought, I mean, like, this is what the experts said the purpose of life was. So Jesus hears this. Like, this isn't groundbreaking. This isn't new news to anybody. Love God, love others. Okay, that's not the issue. So Jesus says, cool, not exactly cool, but he says something like that. He says, do this and you will live, right? Which should be the end of the exchange, right? The lawyer said, hey, Jesus, I got a question. Jesus said, I got a question for you. The guy said, well, let me answer your question. Jesus says, okay, great. You would think that would be the end of the exchange. Like you think it would be conversation over, except it isn't. Because this is what the text says in verse 29. By the way, I just have to say this. Sometimes I hear people say, the the Bible's so boring not if you, if you read it for more than 10 minutes. The Bible's not very boring because this stuff's really good. Look at this. Verse 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, then who's my neighbor? So this man's not content. And I love this. It's like this kind of like, oh, like you get the, like the heart of this man. This dude had an agenda all along, right? The question was a setup. The question was, it was not, he wasn't looking for a response from Jesus on what, where he could find life. He was looking to pick a, a fight with Jesus. The lawyer has an issue with Jesus. He disagrees with Jesus. His questioning is to get to the point of their disagreement, which was why Jesus would hang out with people who were unlike him. Why would Jesus hang out with people who weren't like Jesus and people who weren't like this lawyer? Why would he do those things? Why was Jesus so inclusive with all of these people who were supposedly far from God? That's this point of conflict. And that has something to do with who your neighbor is. So this guy basically says, yeah, yeah, we can do Torah all day. But who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? I don't agree with you, Jesus, on who you think our neighbor is. So Jesus begins to tell this story. And there are all kinds of things that you're going to see in this story, but there's a really big idea that I don't want you to lose perspective on. If you're taking notes, I want you to think about this thing. The question the story is answering that Jesus dives into is this. Who is my neighbor and what is the minimum standard for loving them? That's the question, okay? So there's all kinds of crazy things that go on, but that's the basically it. Like, can we just know, like, who's my neighbor and what's the minimum standard? What's the least I can get by with and still be happy, right? Which just shows the nature of the tension of our human hearts, right? I mean, this is where we live. It's like, okay, I want to give, but just like, what's the minimum that I can do, you know? Like, what's that? So Jesus launches into this story that that is going to be familiar, but I hope there's some unfamiliar stuff in here. Listen to this. He starts to tell a story about a certain man who was going from Jericho to Jerusalem on this particular road, Jericho to Jerusalem. I want you to remember this. Jericho to Jerusalem, and while he's on this road, which was known for being treacherous, he is mugged, he is beaten, he is robbed, and he's left for dead on the side of the road. And so there's a bloody beaten individual who is penniless now laying on the the side of this road between Jericho and Jerusalem. This is Jesus sort of setting the whole thing up. And then in verse 31, this is where he goes. He says, now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, this is kind of cool. This is Um, Jesus is actually being funny here, and I love this, that Jesus has a sense of humor. Jesus is being funny because the road between Jericho and Jerusalem was treacherous not because of robbers alone, but also because it was bordered by cliffs. And so this road was actually more like a path. And so when it says this guy's like bloody on the side of the road, and he passed by on the other side, the picture Jesus is painting is him like sneaking past this bloody guy and like not falling over the cliff as he goes by and he's like, whoo, man, made it out alive. That's actually what Jesus is saying. So when he says it, certainly the crowd kind of chuckled like, okay, yeah, pass by the other side on that road. Like, we know what that would look like. Then another similar individual comes along. Verse 32, he says, so likewise, same way, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, Levites are also, there's priests and Levites. They are both very religious people. They both are involved in the religious acts of the temple. And so the assumption, as the hearers are hearing the story, the assumption is, well, the religious people are the bad people. That's the point. No, I want you to see something else here. 
the man on the side of the road has been beaten, right? And he's bloody, we can all assume. According to the Torah, if you have contact with somebody else's blood, you would be considered ceremonially unclean. And if you're a priest or a Levite and your job is to minister to the masses, if you were to somehow touch that guy while you passed him, you would be determined unclean and therefore not fit to conduct your duties to all of the people that you were called to minister to for a certain period of time. So what looks at first for us to be this moment of turning a blind eye to someone's pain is actually them responding like, do I touch this bloody individual and then not do all the things I could be doing for all these other people? There's a bigger question at play here. So this story plays these guys as bad guys when you look at it at the surface, but then you realize there's more going on here. Then a third guy comes along. And I just want to pause for a moment and think about this. A lawyer asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he see, talks about a priest and he talks about a Levite, both of them coming by. And now a third person enters the story. And if you're the lawyer and you're asking, who's my neighbor? The logical conclusion would be that the third guy in the story is going to be another lawyer, right? Right? Because Jesus is going to tell you a story about what you're supposed to do. So already, the priest and the Levite rolled under the bus, but now I'm going to show you, Mr. Lawyer, how lawyers are supposed to act. And so this is the rhythm. I'm going to now talk about a lawyer who comes along, and this is what he does. And so the, the assumption would be there, and yet Jesus does just the opposite. Verse 33, the lawyer never saw this coming. He says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The crowd probably groaned when Jesus said this. Because the teachers of the law, the lawyers, like this guy, they hated, they hated Samaritans. You know how you feel when somebody abuses a puppy? You know that feeling? Or, or an animal. Or when somebody abuses a child. You know that visceral feeling that you get? Like you're, there's this thing that rises up inside of you. You know that feeling? That's how these people felt about Samaritans. Samaritans are hated. In fact, the idea that we just say good Samaritans in such an easy way, like we just assume, well, it's a good Samaritan, that's an oxymoron in that culture. It's like airplane food, right? Or rap artist, <laughs> right? Like, like how can you... Be a good Samaritan, right? So, so Jesus finishes the story with a Samaritan, and, and, and he's the hero. This hated individual is the hero. And then Jesus turns to the lawyer, and I just love this. He turns to the lawyer, and he goes, hey, so um, which of the three do you think was a neighbor? <laughs> right? And it's like Jesus drops the mic on the guy in this moment. Instantly you see how brilliant Jesus is because he like started this whole thing with a question and then the questions go back and forth and Jesus tells this story where it's like he's off in the deep weeds. You're like, where is he going with this? And then he ends with the Samaritan, brings it back and says, who is the neighbor? And the answer is the Samaritan, right? Like we all know that, the Samaritan, that's correct. But how does the lawyer answer? I love this. The lawyer just simply says, the one who showed mercy. He can't even bear to say the Samaritan's name. He can't even call it out. He just says, the one who showed mercy, that's your neighbor. That's your neighbor. That's who you're called to love. In loving your neighbor, the one that you hate, the one that you despise, the one you wish didn't even exist, the one whose name you can't even say, in that you somehow find life. Jesus is completely reversing and undoing our understanding of how you and I live our lives. Not lived for self, but lived so selflessly for others that even the most vehement enemy of ours is loved by us. This is an undoing of the human experience. This is a rewriting of how we live our lives. This is completely different. Jesus is, is talking about something that's far deeper and far more transcendent than just obeying another list of rules. He's saying there is a completely different way of living towards humanity, and that way is modeled in how God has lived towards you, that you, while you were still enemies of God, he loved you. He embraced you. 
He brought you in. He's saying you love other people the way God has loved you. That is the example. Jesus is challenging this man to extend divine love to anyone, including an enemy. And he does the same for us. That's what Jesus is talking about. So Jesus taught this. He modeled this. He called us to this. The byproduct of this is that the first church was so committed to this sort of life, that the first church so lived this sort of love towards others, this life for others, that it literally turned the world upside down. In the first, second, third century, the name of Jesus became so famous because the people of Jesus lived so radically different than the culture around them. They lived not for themselves. They lived for the good, the well-being of others. They were constantly asking, what can we do for you? How can we live for you? How can I take my life and leverage it for the best for you? That's the way they lived. In fact, the Roman Emperor Justus, or Julian, sorry, the Roman Emperor Julian, um, during his reign, paganism was dying in the Roman Empire and Christianity was flourishing and he was really upset about this. Like, we need more pagans. And so he said this, he said, the religion of the Greeks does not prosper. Why do we not observe how the charity of Christians to strangers has done the most to advance their cause? It is disgraceful that these Christians support our poor in addition to their own. (laughs) Right? Because that's who Christians were, right? They were people for others. They were in a world of self. They were a people of others. That's what Jesus calls us to. How do you and I experience eternal life now? How do we live a flourishing life in the present? The answer is live a life of others amidst a world that is for the self. That's the key to this. That's the answer to this. How do we do that? I'll give you three quick things. If you're taking notes, you can jot these down. Here's three different departments, if you will, in which you can live for others. The first one is renewal. Engage in the renewal of all things, especially people. To look at your own life and ask the question, is there some place, is there somewhere where I'm spending time investing in another person for their sake and not my own? That is a key to eternal life. That is a key to a fulfilling life is that you and I can sit across the table from somebody over coffee and be there not for ourselves but for that person. That you and I can volunteer and sit in a kid's classroom on a Sunday morning and invest ourselves in the life of seven or eight young men or young women who are going to influence and shape our culture and it's not about us. That does something to us. That's life to us. It's about you and I giving our time and our energy to allow other people's lives to be renewed, to be changed, to be shaped by the gospel. And so the question we have to ask, is there some place where we're renewing? Is there some place in your life where you say, I'm giving myself to something other than myself? Am I giving myself to others? It might explain our unhappiness if we're not. The second one is, is to offer relief. There are times and situations where we are the Good Samaritan, where we do come alongside of people and we help and we meet the needs. We see the things that are happening around us in our world and we decide, I would rather go with less and see this need met than than not see this thing addressed. There is a relief dynamic. We talk about our affiliates all the time at Summit and how we're partnering with different organizations around our city for the causes of justice and mercy. We don't do that because it's fun or hip. We do that because we're called to do that. So if there's a place in your life where you say, I want to feel like I'm offering relief, I want to feel like I'm doing something to help somebody out there that needs my help, there's a brochure that's on a chair nearby you that gives all sorts of opportunities. Is there a place where you're offering relief to people in your life instead of relief to your own life? The third one, and this is a big one for a lot of us, it's reform. Are we truly living our lives in a way that brings systematic, fundamental change to our society? Are we just adapting Jesus to fit our cultural norms? Are we living societal reform ourselves? Are we challenging the systems or are we just living inside of them? That's what Jesus is calling us to. We're, We're talking about popularizing the unselfie. That's what Jesus was doing. Like, could it be that we start posting unselfies, hashtag, right? Like, like could, could we catch other people? Could we catch ourselves? Like, now, obviously, this is, don't post an unselfie of yourself because that's selfish. Don't do that. But what if you saw somebody else doing something? You're like, hashtag unselfie. That's awesome, right? That'd be amazing. That's what we're talking about here. 
How do you become a person for others? Jesus taught this. Jesus modeled this. And Jesus shows us the way. He was so clear about this. I want to be honest about this. You and I will be generous. You and I will give of our time. You and I will make sacrifices for other people when we have a sense of abundance. Right? I mean, this is just it. Like, if you get a windfall of cash, like, you know, some relative, distant relative passes away and you get cash, isn't there this thing, like, or, like you find a Starbucks card on the, on the street somewhere, it, whatever, you know, like the insurance company writes you a check, you overpaid your taxes, whatever. Isn't it amazing how when you have a little bit extra, you find yourself like, hey, let me get this, man. You, like, buy people's coffee. You do that, right? Like, you get a little bit of money, you're like, I just want to do something nice for someone, right? I just want to do something good for somebody. Like, you're at dinner with friends, you're like, ah, I got this one. And you know the reason you're doing that is that you've got cash in the bank to pay for it, Right? Because you wouldn't do it if you didn't have cash in the bank to pay for it. There's a thing that happens. When we know our abundance, we are generous out of that abundance. That's the relationship of abundance and living for others. I know there's a lot of Christian speakers and a lot of Christian pastors that get up and try to make Americans feel bad for eating steak and driving two cars. But you know what? I think that lasts like three weeks. Like, we could take the offering at the end today, and you guys would be like, yeah, I need to give more. You're right. I, my car is too nice, and we had steak twice last week or whatever. And <laughs> we guilt people. You know, the Bible isn't about guilt. The Bible isn't guilting people, and Jesus isn't trying to guilt you into living a life out of abundance towards other people. The Bible simply speaks to the abundance that we have in Christ. When we understand the non-physical abundance that we have been given, that abundance has physical resorts. Are you with me on this? In the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul was writing about the generosity of the Macedonian Christians toward the Jewish Christians. And in this exchange, he's talking about thanking the Macedonian Christians for pouring out generously towards the Jewish individuals who were experiencing a famine in Jerusalem. And what's fascinating is that the assumption for most of us would be, well, the Macedonians were doing that because they had an abundance, because they were socially elite, because they had wealth, because they weren't under strife. And yet the opposite is true. The Macedonians were under just as much pressure as the people living in Jerusalem were. But what Paul says is they responded out of the abundance. Their understanding of what Christ had done for them allowed them to sacrificially give towards others even when they didn't have it. So how do we become a, become a people for others? How do we become a people for others in a world of self? We acknowledge the grace of Jesus Christ. This is how grace changes everything. Because when you and I understand all that Jesus has done for us, when we understand the spiritual dynamic, the emotional dynamic, the relational dynamic, suddenly all of those things that we once thought were valuable become so much less than what we have in Christ. And our natural response is to live abundantly to and for others. And it turns out that we're a lot happier as a result. Those same psychologists that have discovered that there's a correlation between selfishness and a lack of happiness have also discovered that the number one way for a person to increase their happiness quotient in their life today, that's the way it's referred to, is to engage in altruistic service. Meaning we do something for another person where we get no benefit. That's what makes us happier. Science is proving what Jesus knew 2,000 years ago, what we all need to know if we want to live a flourishing life. And I know it isn't easy. I came into this weekend with a list of things I wanted to do. I've been traveling, I've been on the road, there was stuff I wanted to do. I sometimes like to be alone in my garage, which is tough when you live in my house, but I just wanted like a little bit of alone time. I had a few projects I wanted to do. I made a list, and then I told my wife, and she had a different plan for this weekend. Because <laughs> there was a car wash for my daughter's dance team, and there was a garage sale, and my wife... Um, some friends of ours were celebrating their anniversary, and they have a four-year-old and two-year-old son, and she thought it'd be nice if we took them for the weekend as well, and um, there were all these, my daughter had a soccer tournament, and so I had this list of what I wanted, and then I had the list of what my wife had volunteered me for, 
<clears throat> and I will just say this. Yesterday morning when I woke up, I, I, I just, I'll confess, I'm admitting this to her for the first time today, but she's not in this service. Um, I was not happy. I, was, like, I, I wanted to do my to-do list. I didn't want to do a car wash. I didn't want to do a rummage sale. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to babysit. Like, I, I'm not hiring. Like, you don't, I'm not, I don't babysit. I don't do that. Like, I barely, like, I love my kids. That's like, I always say that I love my kids and I tolerate other people's kids. So, so I went into yesterday. I'm just, like, frustrated. I'm not getting my stuff done. And then um, as the day kind of rolled on, I was just, like, doing all this stuff. And I found myself, like, really happy. And I went to the soccer game, and I picked up the four-year-old boy, and I took him with me, and we're at the soccer field, and we were there for so long, like three hours. We're at the soccer field, and I'm just like, he is all energy and all words. Like, he's just going and talking nonstop, and I'm just like, at one, at one point, I looked, and I just re I realized I was just smiling. I had a smile on my face, and I don't have a resting happy face. I have the other resting face. And I just all of a sudden I realized, like, I am so happy. And we watched the soccer game, and this little guy's like crawling all over me and like running to wrestle and hit me with this Tyrannosaurus Rex and all this stuff. And we're just like hanging out. And, and at the end of the day yesterday, I realized I had one of the best days I've had. And it was a day that I didn't get anything done for me. And I went, isn't that ironic based on what we're talking about today? Because Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Grace changes everything. And Jesus. Jesus can turn us into a people for others in a world of self. And when you allow him to do that in your life, the joy quotient goes up significantly. The happiness quotient goes up significantly as you pour your life out for others the way he did for you. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? May you be liberated from our cultural obsession with self. May you be released to live unselfishly. May you be redeemed by the abundant grace that has been poured out upon you. Amen. Amen. Love you guys so much. Let's go post some unselfies. See you guys next Sunday. See you later.